Thank you all so much for being with us this Sunday morning. We still have a few folks coming in. And so as we wait for others to join, I'd love for you to give us a sense of who you are, who's in the room with us this morning. Um, and if so, if you could let us know uh, where you're joining from today and how many people are watching with you in the chat, um, we'd love to hear your voice in the chat. Thank you. We're just going to start in another minute after we have a few more folks join us and we hear a little bit about where you're all coming from and how many people are joining you. Wonderful. Mary Claire, thanks for joining us from Waukegan. Wonderful. Else, let us know where you're coming in from today. There's about 50 of us here this morning. I know that those numbers will continue to go up. Thanks for coming, Ryan. Chicago, Andersonville, wonderful Terry, Elizabeth, thanks for being here from Chicago, S. Dixon from Aurora, great, oh, an aspiring farmer in Evanston, wonderful, Cheryl's in from Wakanda, Goose Island, awesome, Tessa, thank you, Bridgman, Michigan, wonderful, Champaign, oh, Peter, Brussels, geez, I wonder what time it is there, thanks for joining us. Um, Urbana. Thanks, Tom. Glad to see you all here this morning. Lincoln Square. Hoping to peel the twins off of their screens to watch. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Good luck with that. I hope they will join us. Peter. Oh, Peter in Brussels. It's 5 p.m. Great. It's cocktail hour in Brussels. Right. Terry and Jerry. Um, wonderful. Thank you for being with us. Glad that you know Inez, wonderful. Okay, so I will go ahead and just get us started. There may be others who join us and hopefully they can also tell us where they're joining from and how many are with them. Um, but in the interest of moving forward with our full agenda, um, I'd like to wish you a good morning. And I am Anna Garcia Doyle, the Executive Director of the One Earth Film Festival. We're going into our 10th year. And we welcome you to our virtual screening and discussion of Seasons of Change on Henry's Farm. Like so many other events, this one's original context was upended by the pandemic. Its date, which was planned for March, and its location, oh, the super cool space at Patagonia Chicago on the Magnificent Mile in their retail store, which is not really what people think of as, you know, a theater space, but it is really fun to just be loaded in there and sitting um, amidst the displays. It's really cool. So hopefully next year. Uh, but we're glad to be able to finally proceed virtually today with all of you. We anticipate that this morning's event will present rich opportunities for learning and provide a brave and safe space for critical conversation around issues that matter deeply at this time in our nation and in our world. This year's festival 2020 theme was and is the power of we, reminding us in this pandemic and election year that we can make change for our planet, both individually and collectively. One of mission is to utilize the power of film to spark awareness and action on issues of environment and topics intersected with environment, including social justice. One way that mission is perhaps reflected is in this quote, which if you've been with us this week, this is our ninth screening in six days. So you may already have heard me say this, but hopefully you're deepening your um, connection to this. I certainly feel connected to this quote. And it's, I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that. And then I realized I am somebody. That is our invitation to you today, among other things, to realize that you are somebody and that you can do something. So just um, looking at our agenda for, it says virtual evening, it's our virtual morning into early afternoon, and that will take place in four parts. So we're welcoming you now. Soon we're gonna introduce you to some folks who'll help us have a great discussion after the film. Right before we view the film, our AV lead, Garen, will share some quick Zoom basics. For now, know that we should all be muted unless we're called upon to speak. And we will be using the chat for questions and discussion. We're then gonna watch the film together via Zoom's screen share feature. We're gonna have a facilitated discussion with the film's director, which is such a treat, about the film and its themes, including social and environmental justice in our time of climate change. 
And we'll end as we always do by sharing some concrete actions you can help, you can take to help in the areas of tonight's film and discussion. Um, some of those actions will be shared by our partners at Family Farm. One last thing before we meet our facilitator and program participants, and I do think this is important anytime we're building community, is to amplify that community. So if you're active on social media, please tell people that this is happening. I would now like to introduce Karen Kiddo, our discussion facilitator for today. Karen has been an active member of a few green groups in Oak Park, Illinois, bordering Chicago here, including the green team for the parent teacher organization at Brooks Middle School and for Planet Green, Oak Park's municipal sustainability plan. Karen relocated this year to Porto Alegre, Brazil, where she is teaching fine arts at an international school and will be looking for ways to greenly navigate her new landscape as she gets her bearings. And so that is one really wonderful benefit of being virtual that Karen can still join us, though she now lives in Brazil. So thank you so much, Karen, for playing the role of facilitator today. And um, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you, Anna. Hello. Uh, so this afternoon, it's afternoon for me here, this morning for you, we begin by unpacking issues of justice in regards to our environment and the relationship of humans to one another and our shared earth in the context of our changing climate. As we live current movements and reframe narratives around justice, environment, and solutions to the climate crisis, we look toward the future. I'm happy to be here today helping guide a conversation that attempts to spark and sustain actions for the protection of our one earth and the just, equitable, regenerative treatment of its resources and its people. Before we start, I'd like to go over just a few agreements that we'll use today in our time together. So here we go. Number one, we approach the conversation with respect. Number two, we'll put aside our preconceptions. Number three, we will internalize what we've learned. Number four, let's acknowledge our privilege. Number five, use I statements and get comfortable with your story. Number six, practice active listening. And finally, we'll be using one mic at a time, so everyone will be muted and less called upon to speak. So let's quickly get a sense of why folks came to be here today. Why are you joining us at this virtual screening? So you can throw some answers in the chat and uh, we'll just see, see what's drawn people to this screening today. I know I was drawn to this movie initially because I've always loved shopping at farmers markets. And so to have a film about a farmer just seemed like ideal. Um, they do talk about know your farmer, know your food. And I thought, well, watching a film about seasons of change on Henry's farm seems like a pretty great way to know my farmer, know my food. All right, so Cheryl says that she loved the book and knew that the film was being created. So that's great. You've got a, a different entry point for that. That's really cool. Why else have people chosen to come and spend their Sunday morning watching a film about a farmer? Okay, so we've got Elizabeth who's got a small garden and wanted to learn more about farming. Another aspiring farmer um, from Lotolski. Another who read the book with some fellow master gardeners. Wow, Linda, that is impressive. And Jean has a daughter who is an organic farmer in Georgia. So the community of farmers is awesome. Yeah, Bernadette, you sound a little like me. Just want to eat good food and support the farmers. I've, I was saying to um, the rest of the crew here when we met earlier, we've got a little farmer's market in our parking garage in, in my apartment in uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil. And it's just two guys who come, they set up two tables and they, they, sell, they sell the food that they've grown. It's incredible. And they come every Thursday. So the, the farm comes to me. All right, so we've got and to support Inez. That's nice. I see Ronit wants to support Inez and being interested in sustainable organic farming. Yeah, and the film is wonderful. Documentary film is your favorite genre, Jen. My daughter loves documentaries as well and an avid edible gardener. Okay, so we've got lots of food and gardening and, uh, and book readers, and it sounds like we've got some things in common to get started here. Thanks for that. All right, 
we'll move on and get ready to watch the film. So we often watch movies and then just walk out of the theater or close down our computer and, and we don't maybe reflect on what we've seen or how we felt about it or what implications it has for our lives. So today we plan to have a rich and thought provoking dialogue sparked by Seasons of Change on Henry's Farm, joined by the film's director. So we invite you while watching the film and participating in dialogue to consider what you learn and how we might personally and collectively support the well-being of ourselves, our neighbors and our communities amidst the environmental and social justice challenges of our times. I would like to introduce Inez Summer, director of Seasons of Change on Henry's Farm, who will introduce her film. The film was released in 2019 and is 83 minutes long. Inez. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, you know, during uh, this uh, time of kind of isolation, uh, one of the saddest parts for filmmakers is really that we don't get to encounter our audience members in person. Uh, so I'm so grateful to the One Earth Film Festival to kind of uh, integrate a very uh, kind of dynamic dis discussion with just showing the film. So. Thank you and kudos uh, to the One Earth Film Festival for pulling all of this together. Um, the film that you're about to see uh, was shot over the course of several years. Uh, it takes place on Henry's farm. Um, it's a small vegetable organic uh, operation outside of, uh, right outside of Congerville. Congerville is a very small community right between uh, Bloomington Normal and Peoria in central Illinois. So for folks who are outside of uh, our range, it's about a three and a half hour drive from Chicago. So I spent uh, many, uh, days and weeks uh, traveling back and forth between Chicago and, and the farm uh, to capture some of the footage. Uh, I think what you'll encounter is just a close-up look at the operation of a farm, uh, the beauty in that work, but also some of the challenges that farmers are facing now and looking into the future. So the film is very much about, you know, what's coming towards us in terms of climate change as well. And you'll see it's not a theme that comes early in the film because the film kind of develops chronologically, but later on. Uh, so I don't want to front load your experience too much, but I'd love to hear your insights and thoughts and questions uh, when we return. And I hope that uh, many of you can stay and uh, talk, uh, talk with us about this. Okay, wow. That was uh, just as good the second time. So folks, what are some of the scenes or moments or people or lines in that film that you remember? Just do a quick share in the chat. Let's see what, what stood out for people. I see Chloe dancing. Zoe, I think it's Zoe, is it? Yeah, that dancing was, okay. <laughs> Just because you're losing a battle doesn't mean you don't keep on fighting. That's from Jeremy. And Nancy says hard work, but really rewarding. Ow, Zora is Zoe's full name. Thank you, Inez. Terry says, Terry's humbled by the incredibly hard work of the people in this country who feel proud to feed us all. And S. Dixon's takeaway is if you face it, you have hope instead of a false sense of security. Yeah, and Jean, nature doesn't want to raise 100 acres of soybeans. So lots of lines that have stood out for people. Beautifully produced film. Biodiversity is important. Yeah, and Henry certainly lived that. Let's take a couple more, couple more moments here to think about the stress and worry on their faces, says Bernadette, who has seen that look on other farmers. So yeah, a scene, a moment, a line, a person, something that you remember. 
saying the farm was like a cathedral. My dad carries with him a kind of sacredness. Without, without it, it just feels like a job. And that's from Joyce. Thank you. Watching the crew, says Laura, working in the field in the rain, brought back memories of spending a three solid week trip in rain gear working on a farm in Washington, DC. You just have to keep going even when it seems hopeless. And as Dixon friends who are farmers in Australia who've been battling climate change for decades. And Tessa saying, what Henry described as the most difficult stage in life where you need to decide what you're gonna do, where you're gonna do it, and who you're gonna do it with. And then Inez's impeccable eye at capturing the perfect images. That's a great comment, Jeremy. Um, so let's think about maybe, maybe just reflect a little bit Think about how you related to the film personally. And I think some of you are already starting to move in that direction, thinking about friends you know and experiences you've had. What delighted you? What angered you? What made you sad? What, what did you kind of connect to or, or feel that engaged you personally? And again, let's just throw comments in the chat and see, see what we have to share. Henry's passion for his crops and his customers, says Cheryl. Tessa says, no idea it was possible to grow that much variety organically in Illinois. So feeling inspired to get working on the garden. So yeah, that's a pretty concrete thing to relate to personally. I didn't know that either. Talking about cutting back from 50 to 32 kinds of lettuce. Continuing to support local organic farmers. And Jim says Henry's reverence for the soil and for growing food in harmony with nature in spite of the imbalances created by the climate crisis. Laura says Henry having to reconcile his fellow farmers' views of climate change with his own. And think indeed about those, those categories, moments of delight, moments of anger, moments of sadness, moments that made you feel something about you, maybe. Delight. This is from Elizabeth. When Henry's wife realized she's actually accepted back in Japan after initially fearing she wouldn't be. Thank you. The cool thing about interplanting, says S. Dixon, instead of leaving fields fallow, is that the biomass absorbs CO2 and reduces it in the air. Kind of a win-win. All right, a couple more comments, a couple more reflections. Sad, says Cheryl, that he lost some of his soil that he worked so hard to create. Thank you. And Bernadette says, we as consumers have a responsibility to buy local. Okay, so moving right into action there, Bernadette, thank you. So let's bring back our filmmaker, Inez Summer. Inez is a Chicago-based documentary filmmaker and educator. Her goal is to bring a lyrical yet engaging lens to topics that matter, be they sustainable farming and climate change in Seasons of Change on Henry's Farm, or human rights and participatory democracy in her previous documentaries. So we are so excited to have you here and having had 
me ask the audience a few questions, I think it's time for the audience to ask you some questions. Um, I would like to start, I'll just throw one out there to get things rolling and then audience, you can think of some questions for Inez, throw them in the chat and we'll see, uh, we'll see what we can do. So I wondered, as you got to know um, Henry and his life, which is a tough one, what did you find encouraging? What, what gave you hope as you completed this project or as you worked on the project? You know, so initially this film was supposed to be a short, uh, just looking at uh, kind of the good people who bring us this very good food, right? And uh, once I got to know Henry and his family a little bit, the, the kids were all out of the house, but they come back uh, during kind of these intense harvest days in the fall. So it was an opportunity to meet all of them. And I was immediately attracted to Henry's family because, uh, you know, my kids are a similar age. Uh, I really identified with Hiroko too, because I'm an immigrant. So there was a lot uh, where I'm like, oh, this is so interesting. I, I think there's more, we should film more than just, you know, these two or three days. And then the film kind of grew organically uh, from that, uh, where, you know, there were a number of moments where I could have stopped and it would have been a fine film in itself. But I, you know, there was always something new and intriguing. So I don't think I went into making the film out of a sense of hopelessness, but there was always kind of curiosity about, oh, how does this actually work? You know, I, I didn't know that farmers are such artists and scientists in some way, right? When Henry goes across the fields with his notebooks and how he's so meticulous in recording everything. I mean, that's a scientific approach, right? So every day being with them brought something new that I could learn from and hopefully the audience learns from. So there was always the sense of, if you want hope in that, because learning is also kind of embracing the, the world around us and, and, you know, trying to make sense of things. Um, so I think the question of hope really came up more towards the end of the film when, you know, Henry has that realization about climate change. Uh, and, you know, that definitely infused how the third act of the film had to play out, that we have to be realistic and address it, but that there also has to be a glimmer of hope because otherwise, you know, what's the, what's the point, right? Um, that's kind of how far I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. Laura says people don't realize how data driven, data driven farming is. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? Because I have more. I'm going to go ahead with another one of mine. I'm wondering if there are some little things that you might have learned in your time on the farm um, that had an impact on you. And I was enjoying all those scenes in the kitchen and thinking, I wonder if you maybe came back with uh, with a recipe or a, you know, a cooking technique. There were so many ingredients that maybe, I know I wasn't familiar with all of them. Um, is there something like that that you kind of still use or still refer to? Well, I started growing my own vegetables. That was a major shift for me. <laughs> so definitely came out of, out of that experience. Uh, and it's been fun. I have a very messy backyard, but for some reasons, those vegetables still grow really well. <laughs> so um, you know, feeling um, the sense of, um, so that, that's definitely a, a big impact that just making the film had, uh, but also f uh, kind of observing how Henry goes about his day, the, the, all the planning and so on, that's also, you know, as filmmakers, we often complain about, you know, how hard it is in terms of funding and to get our projects forward. But then I just have to compare myself to what Henry is doing everything every day. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is much harder what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a question from Jean, who is our tech Aaron's mom. And, sh and uh, she wonders over how many years did you film Henry and this film? How many years? So I started filming in the fall of 2014, uh, all throughout 2015. That's when Henry was in Japan and Hiroko were in Japan and the interns ran the farm. And then a bit into 2016, then had to take a break, came back in 2017. That's when you see all these flooding events. And, you know, on the one hand, it's, you know, the, the kind of filmmaking that I enjoy is kind of longitudinal. Uh, 
but it also certainly has to deal with funding, you know, so I only had enough money to hire an editor for a certain amount of time, then I had to take a year's break to raise more money so that uh, the editor could come back. So, you know, it's a long kind of gestation for a film like that, part of it by design and part of it just, it's not a commercial kind of film, right? It's a film driven by one person who's passionate about it. <laughs> is trying to kind of scotch tape things together. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have Nancy who says she really enjoyed Henry's story and wonders if you would consider filming a traditional farmer's life and what that family think about climate change and passing on farming to the next generation. You know, I think that would be super interesting. I we tried not to vilify industrial agriculture in the film because I think Henry would feel uncomfortable being like too um, condemning about what his neighbors do. You know, I mean, he's realistic about it, but he also has to live in that community. So I wanted to respect that. I think it would be really interesting to do some comparison. And I understand that some of the younger generation farmers are actually interested in exploring uh, you know, some organic farming techniques. So I think it's, it's complicated, you know, uh, farmers overall, I think the average age is now in their sixties, right? So there will be a generation or the other very soon. Okay. Thank you. From Angela in the chat, what is Henry doing now? I wondered that too. Yeah, so Henry, you know, keeps farming and keeps adapting and trying new things. I mean, that's one of the other impressive things about him is that he constantly is trying to figure out new ways how to do things, uh, plants new vegetables, new uh, ways to, uh, you know, like he's doing much, a lot more no-till kind of farming now. So, you know, he's adapting his practices to I think that only works to a certain degree because he can't control the flooding, for instance. So I know that every year since we finished filming, he said it's getting worse. So every year is worse than the previous year in terms of weather events. And that's just something that's out of the control of the farmer, right? So he might have to leave those bottom fields completely and just, uh, you know, farm on, on the hill where the soil is not quite as good. Um, I think they had a terrible drought at the beginning of uh, this year. So a lot of the plants that they had put in the ground died. And then there was uh, like intense rainfall, like six inches within a few hours. So a lot of vegetables drowned. You know, you can see like this is actually getting uh, even harsher in terms of the, the conditions. And I think then it turned around towards the end of the summer. So, you know, he's still able to run the farm, but it's, it's definitely more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And we have Cheryl asking if you got the feeling that Henry would scale back his farm, which I think is related to sort of, you know, what's he doing now? And it sounds like some of that is a bit inevitable. Right. I think he would have loved to do that before he went to Japan. I mean, you all heard his thinking about that. He wanted to be more hands on and, you know, also looking towards, you know, an older age. Right. But given these, uh, Kind of weather events he's not able to uh like reduce his workload at all i think he's working harder than ever right now um okay thank you bernadette says how did you pick henry's family it's an interesting family dual cultural um like hers and she likes henry's daughter talking about her identity as bicultural and bilingual so mm -hmm. that's a little bit of, i suppose that you know, so, so sometimes in documentaries, we might have a topic first, and then we are really casting for the right person to fill, kind of to uh, humanize the story about a, a particular topic. In this case, it was the other way around that uh, I was introduced to Henry, and I also met uh, Tara, his sister, who is my co-producer, Tara Brockman, who wrote this beautiful book, Seasons on Henry's Farm. And I read that before we started filming, and I'm like, oh, I so love uh, how she falls an entire year. It's very wonderful description and goes month, month by month and has a lot of recipes. So we kind of adapted her title, but in some way the book is before this realization about climate change uh, kind of is so marked to, and the film is after, right? So it's more of a companion piece, I'd say. But meeting Tara and reading the book, that's kind of when I was like, yes, we definitely want to make, make this short. And then it kind of uh, developed into this very long, <laughs> 
long piece, not short. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Tessa is asking, she says, I'm 22, just out of college with a lot of friends interested in sustainability. Is there a chance to visit the farm or for folks to follow or learn more about Henry's farm? For sure, so they, they have a, a website. I think it's Brockman Family Farming or something like that. I'll look it up in, uh, in a moment. So you could check that out. He, um, you know, people, I've filmed people just coming by for a day or two and volunteering. So that might be an option, right? Uh, he's always looking for interns. So if you want to make a longer commitment and, and really learn a lot, that, that's another option. Um, and then every year in October, he has that big open um, kind of the farm tour. And you've seen two of those examples early in the film is like the, the fall one. And then the, the one more towards the end was with his CSA members. So that's also a very easy way to just get to know the farm a little bit, you know, get on their newsletter and then uh, make it into a day trip. It's super fun. You know, it's about a three and a half hour drive from Chicago. You can arrive in time for the whole tour, stay for kind of potluck. Uh, and sometimes they make that nice fire in the evening too, <laughs> depending on the year. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, Actually, I want to add last year for the farm tour was one of my favorite film screenings because we, uh, I brought a projector and speakers and we projected the film onto the doors of the shed, you know, that big barn where they wash vegetables. So I was basically showing the film like two or three feet away from where the first shots of the film happened. So it was just uh, such a beautiful experience. There were about, oh, I'd say 80, 90 people there sitting on straw bales and folding chairs. So uh, just really lovely, uh, oh, circular experience for me as a filmmaker. <laughs> I bet. Wow. Um, Jim is wondering how easy or difficult was it to capture the flyover scenes? He says, I assume you captured this footage with a drone and it was very important to provide the viewers with the broader perspective of the farm, its topography and its proximity to the woodlands and to the river. Um, as well as the existential threat to his crops and the soil carbon sink. So how was it capturing those flyover scenes? So I'm, I'm so glad you liked those. Uh, I can't cre take credit for those uh, drone shots. Uh, one of Henry's farmhands, uh, Mike Mustard, uh, was actually starting to do his own vlog and he bought a drone and you know started filming things about his, his daily experiences at the farm. So I bartered with Mike, I bought him a hard drive and I told him what kinds of shots I was looking for and he was happy to do those. Uh, so this very micro budget filmmaking, or low budget filmmaking, you know, you have to kind of think about what resources you have. So uh, being able to work with Mike on that was great. Um, there's a shot on top of the roof when they install the solar panels. Uh, I wanted to film that, but the installers were like stood me up, right? So, but one of the installers was there and he says, oh, I have a GoPro that I use for fishing. I'm like, okay, can you film this for me? So, so we at least have two shots that that, uh, that person took for me. So it's just being resourceful, right? <laughs> That's great, kind of a team effort, love it. Um, S. Dixon in the chat says it would be wonderful if this film could be shown on Netflix or somewhere with a wider audience. She says, or he says, S. Dixon says, I think seeing the details might convince climate change deniers. So where or how can folks see or share about the film? And is there a broad reach opportunity like Netflix or similar to see the film? So right now the Gene Siskel Film Center still has it on their website and I'm really grateful to them for holding on to the film for so long. I'm sure it's not like the, the biggest money maker in any way, but you know, just have the opportunity to actually show the film on a continuous basis has been, has been great. Uh, you know, Netflix is actually not very approachable. So I probably would have to get an agent. It's not, you know, for most folks, it just seems to be like the go-to place, but you know, they're very driven by data. So unless they think this will be a big commercial uh, success, it's very hard for independents to get their work onto Netflix. So, you know, do I have the resources to get an agent? I'm not entirely sure. But, you know, that would be great. Maybe Amazon Prime down, down the line, that seems a little easier to get onto. Okay. But typically for what we do with films, we typically first do a festival run for a little bit. And then uh, I also want to look into educational distribution. Great. 
Any other, Ivy's asking if you're connected with Sustain and You to show it as an online event. Hmm. I haven't thought of that yet. <laughs> We've uh, showed it at a number of colleges, but it was still face to face and that was really great. So I, I love it, you know, showing the film to younger uh, folks too. I think uh, many of them identify with Zoe's question about like what to do now. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we have her storyline in, in the film because of that. And I think one of the reactions we got uh, when we did um, screening, I want to say either Wesleyan or Illinois State University, uh, students were saying that a lot of environmental films have like the solution presented to them. And they felt um, really intrigued by a film that's more about having to think through some of these things where there's not just like one action step, right? But there are many things, as we've even seen in the chat, you know, from supporting your own uh, local farmers to maybe doing it yourself, you know, starting to grow your own vegetables to like thinking about career paths. There are many things to take away from a film like this. Um, so I, I like engaging with young people around those issues, too. Mm -hmm. Well, and that leads right into uh, where I was heading, which is the audience. I'm wondering what the audience today would say is the message of the film. And we just heard Inez say maybe it wasn't super prescriptive, although I think that you may have some ideas about that. So audience, what, what do you think is the message of this film, of this story that kind of grew organically? And you can just throw down some of your ideas in the chat. <clears throat> Know your food, know your farmer, Jeremy. Yep, I, I was saying that as well. That's, that's a pretty clear message. Anna says climate change is real and it is affecting our farmers and our food system. Yeah, that seems absolutely. Grown it says, don't give up hope, keep fighting to make the world a better place. And Cheryl says, be adaptable to change and still keep focused on your calling. Ivy says, I feel privileged to be able to know who grew my food, but I wish it isn't a privilege and that that would be available for everyone. Thank you. So what's something that maybe you're now inspired or motivated to do in response to this film? There are a lot of actions that we can consider. There are a lot of big steps and small steps. What do you think you might be able to take some action and commit to? And again, let's just share that in the chat. <clears throat> so certainly there's a lot of broad themes here. Um, the food system, food access. We had the comment about not wanting it to be a privilege to know your farmer, but that it is a privilege all the equity issues that we're looking at so so prominently in people's minds now social justice i mean the themes coming out of this are pretty endless so think a little about about some actions that you might be able to take to be part of the solution Jim says, devote more of my family's food budget to purchasing directly from local farmers. Thank you. So yeah, it is often a question of priorities, choices, trade-offs. Inez, what do you think are some actions that maybe some specific steps that people could be some being part of the solution. What would you suggest for our audience today? 
So in terms of concrete actions, you know, one, one is clearly, you know, support your local farmers, become a member of a CSA, start uh, patronizing farmers markets and so on. So that's, that's an easy one. I think a lot of people will uh, probably already bring some interest uh, to that if they watch the film. Um, I'd say because we're looking at the elections right now, uh, I would recommend to look at the uh, Food and Farm Voting Guide uh, that the Illinois Stewardship Alliance has uh, to just see where uh, your elected officials or the incumbents or the uh, folks running, uh, what are their positions in terms of how we can support sustainable agriculture. Because I think so often we put the onus on us as consumers and also on the farmers to kind of address some of these things when a lot of it is also defined by policy, right? So just think of uh, the billions of dollars that support industrial agriculture in this country and nothing of it goes to organic farmers, right? I mean, it's a complete imbalance. So I think that needs to be addressed too. I think a lot of the uh, rulings around, uh, you know, chemical pesticides, all those kinds of issues, th those are also policy issues, right? Uh, might be under the, you know, agriculture department or EPA, I'm not quite sure, it probably depends on what the rulings are. But I think it's on us also to be kind of more informed about that. Yeah, and we're hearing that in some of our comments as well, um, questions of policy. Uh, Bernadette says we need to have more community gardens on the west side or south side of Chicago. Uh, Laura says support local farmers through legislation as well as your purchasing. So this is exactly what, what Inez is saying. Tell your legislators that small farms need support. Mm -hmm. um, and Ivy says let people know that they can have fresh produce and local food even using SNAP, which if you're not from Illinois, that's sort of a equivalent to food stamps, help with, help with people who need support with their food budgets or reduced price CSA boxes. Um, Cheryl says, educate young people on the reasons to grow your own food. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly Inez was saying that this, this film has had an audience with young people as well. Jeremy's saying to support food co-ops that establish relationships with local farms. And Nancy works for the Conservation Foundation where they do a lot of educational programs. She says, I think we need to keep spreading the message that each person can do something and spread the hope that we can improve our environment. And that takes us right back to the beginning of what Anna was saying, that I am that someone. So you are all that someone. Um, Elizabeth says she's encouraging and helping friends who have space to grow or plant vegetable gardens. I am more empowered now to continue. I don't have a green thumb. I think that's pretty out, outstanding. That's exceptional. Um, Laura says, thank you for mentioning the Illinois Stewardship Alliance, Inez, because policy is really crucial. And Cheryl works with middle school students in a greenhouse and or outdoor garden beds. She wants to provide educational resources for these students, especially now with remote learning. So let me just hit pause on that so I can get Jim's comment here, encouraging the administrators at CPS to purchase an educational license to show your film to teachers, students, and their parents, especially now that they're learning online. So that's tying right in again with our young people, um, our young people audience. And Anna says we need to teach people, especially young people, to cook. This builds a value for good, healthy, well-grown food and a relationship with where your food comes from. And I would just link with that and say if you don't already take your kids shopping with you and take them to those farmers markets, bring them along and let them choose. Even if it's not the best of the peppers, it's the one that they chose. Um, so let's jump back now to Cheryl. Any suggestions for the middle school students, um, greenhouse, outdoor garden beds, educational resources for these students? Inez, what do you think? I don't know if that's your so field. Of on our website, we have like one one page or one, one column that has a lot of resources that might be good for that age group. Uh, so if she wants to go to our website and look for that, uh, it has links to, it breaks it down in, in topics, you know, like biodiversity, and so, et cetera, and so on. So that might be a good starting point. Um, I'm also thinking, you know, one of the earlier comments said something about urban agriculture, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of urban ag. Uh, 
I was surprised, I reached out to a number of groups that there is not as much overlap between organic farming that's, you know, done in rural areas and what's happening in the cities. And I'm not quite sure if there are any groups that work on making, bridging those two kinds of uh, ways of farming, because I think that could be really powerful too. Okay, thank you. So we have a slide here with take action and lots of these ideas have already been shared by some of you in the audience today. These come from you, from us. Um, there's, a, there's a wealth of ideas and information. We're looking about, we're looking at discovering and supporting small business owners, supporting local farmers, a lot of the things that you have already mentioned. Um, so there's some, some of your take action ideas, buy local and, and shop a farmer's market before the season ends. So these markets are still open. If you haven't had a chance to hit one recently, get some fall produce or here in Brazil, we're actually in spring. So we've got tomatoes coming up and uh, some beautiful fruit right now. But if you're in the fall, go and enjoy your fall produce um, and meet, meet a local farmer. Um, I would like to call now on Bob Benenson from Family Farmed to share about the actions his organization provided in the next slide. So Bob, could I ask you to unmute your mic and say a few words, please? <laughs> Sorry about the delay. The no, technology no. allowing me to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I want to uh, reinforce uh, what you were just saying about um, buying local. And uh, here we are, end of October, you think the um, season is uh, winding down. But um, there's uh, very little good you can say about this year with all the problems that we've had, especially uh, surrounding COVID-19. But actually, a lot of farmers have made it a virtue of necessity. And they've really amped up their efforts to uh, provide e-commerce, home delivery, and, and pickup options um, that will enable you to extend your season. They're all planning on uh, uh, selling uh, uh, right through the uh, late fall and the winter. Uh, good uh, Green City Market. Um, I'm fortunate. I live in Lakeview. Green City is my local farmer's market. And um, they took really dramatic action right from the get-go. They lost the end of their last indoor winter season and the beginning of their uh, spring season, but they first immediately provided a platform for their farmers to provide, uh, to uh, uh, promote their own e-commerce sites. Then they developed their own uh, delivery and uh, pickup uh, uh, service uh, through um, uh, an app called What's Good. And um, what they do is they um, take orders from uh, consumers. Uh, they aggregate product from all their vendors and uh, they either uh, through uh, uh, based on consumer preference, will either uh, deliver it, uh, to home for a small fee, or you can pick it up at a designated drop site. There will be no winter market indoors at the Peggy Notabart uh, Nature Museum, as there usually is because of um, uh, social distancing issues. So this is a great way for you to maintain your relationship with Green City Market and also get all that wonderful, delicious food. Lots of uh, uh, crops uh, grown this time of year or storage crops so you can get squash and uh, gourds and um, root vegetables and indoor grown greens all winter long. Um, and uh, you know, the benefit of it, you get this delicious, fresh local food, incredibly nutritious, the best stuff you can eat. Understand that some people have financial limitations, but do what you can because uh, the best way to support local farmers like uh, Henry is to buy their products. Two other farmers markets in Chicago, Logan Square Farmers Market, and uh, 61st Street Farmers Market actually are having indoor markets this year. Um, Lincoln, Logan Square at a place called the Fields Lofts and um, the 61st Street Farmers Market, which is in Hyde Park at the Experimental Station. There are also lots of places where you can get good local food year round. And, uh, um, and most of them deliver. There's uh, Fresh Picks and Niles, Illinois, which works directly with farmers. Again, aggregates orders, home delivers. There's uh, a new outfit called the Village Farm Stand, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, very quickly later, uh, that also aggregates uh, from farmers and, um, and uh, enables uh, consumers to pick up orders. 
There's local foods market in Bucktown. There are co-ops like Dill Pickle in Logan Square and Sugar Beet in Oak Park. And I urge you to um, patronize all, any or all of them because uh, you're doing something really good when you do. Now, uh, we at Family Farmed and Naturally Chicago are having a webinar on Thursday, November 12th. It's not tentative anymore. Um, called, uh, and it's about how exactly what I've been talking about, how farmers have pivoted and adapted to the new circumstances to provide new uh, online e-commerce options for uh, consumers. And uh, our guests in will include, uh, guest speakers will include Mandy Moody, who is the uh, new interim executive director of Green City Market, uh, Tracy Val of Three Sisters Garden in Kankakee, who um, pivoted to create a home delivery service in Chicago and uh, uh, very affordable because orders as little as $20 are free delivery. Hayden Holbert of Avron Farm in Wisconsin. And they've gone all in on e-commerce. And what they've done is really interesting. I think it's a window into where we're gonna go with local food in the future. He's used his e-commerce site to host not only his own products, but other producers. And so the, they aggregate orders uh, from consumers, deliver them uh, to homes in the Chicago area. Judy Thomas from Garfield Produce. They're an indoor grower in the under-resourced West Side community of East Garfield Park. Obviously their, their business has been impacted, so she will discuss how they've uh, adjusted. I mentioned Fresh Picks before, Irv uh, Cernaskis, of, and, and the official name of the company is Irv and Shelley's Fresh Picks. They source directly from local sustainable farmers and take orders for home delivery. And I've saved uh, a Matt Wexler, uh, a village farm stand, for last because he has a, a great connection with the One Earth uh, Film Festival. Matt is actually a professional documentary filmmaker and he created two amazing documentaries over the last few years on food system issues. One is called Sustainable and it's the most gorgeous, most elegaic film you could possibly imagine watching about, uh, uh, about uh, local farming and sustainable farming. The other is a little grittier, it's called Right to Harm and it's about the curse of uh, factory farming. And uh, both of Matt's uh, films have been presented by the One Earth Film Festival. And now just very recently, just earlier this year, he created the storefront in Evanston uh, called the Phil Village Farm Stand. And he's uh, again, working directly with uh, local farmers um, and, uh, and uh, taking orders from customers and aggregating them for, for pickup. And I will say, I, I've taken a look at their website and him being a visual arts professional, his pictures of food will make you hungry. They're so beautiful. So, um, yeah, please, uh, this is, uh, you know, Family Farm has been working for almost 20 years to promote local and sustainable food. Uh, we promote it all the time. We hope you can participate as much as your wall will allow and uh, help us uh, create a better food system overall. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. You have a lot of resources to share and a lot of enthusiasm. Um, uh, and <laughs> thanks. <laughs> we have a lot of resources and enthusiasm in the chat as well. Um, pretty flooded at the moment. I'm just going to keep out a couple of highlights. The CSA is Community Supported Agriculture. It's sometimes called a farm stand. Um, again, that was a uh, question that came up when we were talking about some of the benefits. And so I will say there are some resource tabs that you can look at on the website that you may want to look into. Familyfarms.org is the website. Hey, Karen, sorry to interrupt. It sounds like your audio has dropped out. Oh. There uh, you that's are. Better. Okay, that's better. That's okay, thank you. How far back do I need to go? Thank you. Um, I think we, we lost you talking about resources in the chat. Okay. So we start with, uh, thank you so much. We start with the resources in the chat because Elizabeth was wondering what a CSA is. And so we've had some answers from Anna about that. Those are um, community supported agriculture, kind of like a farm share, a weekly box that you get. And that helps to support farmers and their budgets. Um, and then we've got um, familyfarm.org is where you will find Bob and his many resources. Um, there are a lot of links in here that you know, you may want to follow up if you're looking for something near where you're living. If you're not in Illinois, um, there may be, there are a couple of links um, that people have posted. 
that may kind of be a conglomerate of, you know, depending on where you are, you, you can have a look at some of these different resources. So we've got byfreshbylocal.org and Anna's posted a national CSA directory.com. Um, so there are ways of finding something near you if the many that Bob listed, you know, aren't geographically in your neighborhood. And then Inez has posted that if you want to share the film with friends and family, send them to the siskelfilmcenter.org. And she's got the link for that. Um, yeah, there are a lot of resources here, both about seeing the film and finding uh, different ways of shopping for some farmer food. Okay, that's exciting. Thank you. So we've got more ways to take action on our current slide here. Um, supporting filmmakers is another way to take action. So filmmakers like Inez are telling stories about underrepresented people, people whose stories need to be told. Um, so patronize that independent media and support your local independent filmmaker. Um, you can also donate to crowdfunding campaigns or you can head to independent cinemas if they open again. Um, and of course, this very film festival is something that needs your support. And another thing you can do is vote. Elections up and down the ballot have an impact on climate change. I suspect most of you um, don't need to be persuaded to vote, but make sure you do. It's worth the wait in line. You can check out Stewardship Alliance, um, which compiles responses by candidates running for Congress about issues that, are, that farmers are facing, including food security, climate change, racial equity, and more. Uh, so there are a lot of actions that we can take and we have talked about many of them. I think uh, most of you probably have, you know, your marching orders at this point. So I would like to just thank again, our incredible filmmaker Inez Summer for a really beautiful and engaging film um, and for giving so generously today of your time and your wisdom, your experiences and perspectives. And also to our action partner, Bob Benenson from Family Farmed about the many resources and the actions that we can all take to participate in solutions. So as we close out, I hope that you have a sense of this year's 2020 festival theme, the power of we throughout the film in our engaging discussion and in the way we came here together to build a community around critical issues in today's virtual event. So if you would, maybe you can throw one last comment in the chat about ways you are ready to harness the power of me or the power of we? What do you feel compelled to do because of today's event? So chat it up. Let me know how you will harness the power of me or the power of we. Eat and vote as if your life and your planet depends on it, says Jim. Mm. That's good. Thank you. Oh, and Ivy says my favorite film this week. Time to mulch, says Tessa. Okay, that's, that's a good power of me. A power of me or a power of we. Keep teaching the students. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. This is great. Thanks for your responses. So to learn more about Bob and Inez, you can see the links on the next slide. And please remember to tweet or post or share about this event online and in social media uh, to join us for one more screening this afternoon at 3 p.m. You can go and see Useless in partnership with the Garfield Park Conservatory Alliance. Full details are available on the mini fest page, which is linked. And if you found value in today's event, please donate to One Earth Film Fest. It's a very challenging time for organizations and businesses. Um, and you can also sign up for the e-news so you can be alerted when the festival celebrates its 10th year with more great films and discussions and opportunities for action. That will be in March, 2021. So last but not least, a huge thanks to each and every one of you for being here. We appreciate your participation. I'm always amazed at how even through a chat, you start to feel like you're coming together as a community, even when we're in different places and spaces. So thank you for that. 
let's all give ourselves and our program participants one round of applause. So feel free to unmute your mic and clap out loud or give a wave and let's, uh, let's celebrate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll turn that back over to Anna if you've got some closing, closing thoughts. And may I just jump in for one second uh, because somebody looked at the Gene Siskel Film Center site and said it's expired. This has happened once before. They still put it into their eBlast newsletter and then I need to go back and say, oh, your technicians blocked the access. So I'll, I'll follow up with them. So it should be up on their website back again next week. Thanks, right. Inez. Um, I don't have a lot of things, any comments to say. I just really want to express gratitude to, uh, to Karen for a well-facilitated, really rich discussion and for guiding us through that. Also, of course, to you, Inez, for your beautiful film. So much to talk about and so much to take away um, in actions as inspiration. Also, thanks to Bob. So many great resources and the work that you guys are doing at Naturally Chicago and Family Farm, which just really help us all of our communities here in the Chicago area um, keep some of these topics at the fore. So I'm um, hoping that you guys, if it's your first time with One Earth Film Festival, that you see why we do this, that you see that these films give us an amazing jumping off point to deepen discussion about some of these issues that really matter a lot to our planet and to our own families and our own homes, really. So just really grateful that you all could be here with us. And again, if you have some time this afternoon, join us at three o'clock for Useless the last uh, screening, as Karen said, um, of the Fall Mini Film Festival. And uh, we'd always appreciate your donations if that's something that is um, accessible to you. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>